All right, we're gonna get, I'm gonna get started because we do have a lot of ground to cover and um, a lot of great folks to hear from. I have the, 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 the tricky uh, duty of, of doing the territory acknowledgement in these digital spaces, which is, which is never um, an easy thing. I think we're, everyone's sort of thinking through what that means. Um, but, I, but I do want to acknowledge that uh, UBC itself sits on the traditional unceded um, ancestral territories of the Hunkameenum speaking Musqueam people, which is where the Public Humanities Hub um, is located and where uh, the majority of us, aside um, from Dr. Ansluz, um, are working. I'm actually coming to you um, um, from Coquitlam territory, um, which is a uh, shared territory with Tsleil-Waututh and uh, Akatsi nations. Um, uh, and I think that we have people um, joining us from all sorts of different places. So I'm not, I'm not going to try to address all that, um, but I will point everyone to uh, the Native Land app, nativeland.ca. Um, if you would like to know more about the territory you're on, uh, that's a great um, place um, to go and do that. Um, so welcome. Thank you for joining us for Collaboration Works Two Ways, Data Sovereignty and Representation in Indigenous focus digital humanities. My name's Dave Gertner, and I'm a white settler who works across the disciplines of DH and Indigenous Studies. Um, and with Dr. Mark Turin, um, we co-organize this collection of voices, um, both Indigenous um, and settler, to reflect on some of the ways in which DH and Indigenous Studies intersect um, sort of within this rubric of collaboration that um, this UBC DH conference is framed around. Um, I, I want to acknowledge that it's actually been a really exciting night um, for, or not, not night, when I, I haven't, I still feel like it's night, really exciting week for Indigenous DH. Um, on Tuesday, um, the University of Toronto and the Digital Humanities Network hosted a virtual panel on Indigenous data studies that featured Dr. Jennifer Wemiguan, um, author of Digital Bundle, um, and Dr. Karen Recolet. Um, whose latest art article, Choreographies of the Fall, Futurity Bundles and Landing, is a beautiful piece if you need something to add to your reading list. Um, uh, and just before this roundtable, of course, we heard from Dr. Deanna Rader um, speaking about using DH tools to examine neglected Indigenous texts. Um, I had the very good fortune of joining uh, Dr. Zwemaguant and Recolet on the Indigenous Sovereignty Panel, um, where the conversation quickly turned from how to steward Indigenous data and DH to the colonial structures that, can, that continued to contain and extract that data. Um, this sort of came about as uh, Dr. Ramagrant was reflecting on her realization that the ways in which mainstream or white stream um, perceives virtual reality um, as a space of escape or hypermediacy um, was entirely different from the ways in which she was imagining it as an Indigenous woman working in relation with Indigenous communities. Um, that is, is as a space to articulate new and sometimes very old um, articulations of reciprocity and land-based learning, or what Glenn Coulthard and Leanne Simpson have called grounded normativity. Um, the argument that arose um, when we were taught, uh, uh, the argument that then arose that what we were talking about when we were talking about indigenous DH was not how to further represent indigenous content through digital tools and platforms, but how we as indigenous and allied scholars working in collaboration um, will deconstruct and rebuild the very structures in which DH is imagined and deployed. Um, as Recolet put it, DH needs to be willing to reimagine how the digital allows us to land into one another both in terms of grounded normativity, but also in terms of consensual reciprocity. Um, so when I think of inspired practices, um, the phrase uh, introduced by the First Nations and BC Knowledge Network, um, which this panel is borrowing from um, as an activation site, I think about the ways in which Indigenous and allied scholars uh, at this round table are not simply challenging the colonial frame, but are in fact restructuring the ways that we understand DH as a field um, and as a practice. Be that through social media, through surveillance, library systems, digital mapping, archival systems, archival systems or digitization amongst a number of other topics. Um, and uh, to go back a few years, in 2015, in a keynote titled, What's Next? The Radical Unrealized Potential of Digital Humanities, uh, Miriam Posner wrote, quote, that 
DH needs scholarly expertise in critical race theory, feminist and queer theory, and other interrogations of structures of power in order to develop models of the world that have any relevance in people's lived experience. Truly, it is the most complicated, challenging computing problem I can imagine, and DH hasn't even begun to take it on. Um, I think this panel, and indeed all the panels that have been happening this week um, around Indigenous to DH, demonstrate that Posner's assertion about DH's recalcitrant approach to critical race studies no longer applies in the same way it did five years ago. Uh, and perhaps, um, if we think of the inspired practices that have guided indigenous techno technological thinking since time immemorial, um, it maybe never did. Um, so thank you for being here um, to join us in this discussion. I know we're all looking forward to the conversation um, and the continued inspired practices that it will no doubt provoke. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over um, now to uh, my friend uh, and colleague, Sarah DuPont, who will be moderating this panel. Sarah, it's great to see you. Thanks for helping us out. Thanks so much, Dave. It's an honor and privilege to be serving as chair and moderator for this wonderful panel titled uh, Collaboration Works Two Ways, Data Sovereignty and Representation in Indigenous-Focused Digital Humanities. I am the head librarian of the Huihua Library, and I am a Métis librarian. So Indigenous information practices and their intersections with digital humanities is very much part of our scholarship as librarians and our practice. Before I get started with the introductions of all of our speakers today, I'm going to introduce our volunteer who has generously offered to help us with uh, some technical aspects of our presentation today and also to give some uh, introductions to what's happening in the chat. So without further ado, here's Vicki Baker. Hi hey everybody, thanks so much. Um, my name is Vicki, I'm the volunteer for the session and I'm available for assistance. I'll be collecting the questions for the Q&A portion of this session. If you have a question either for a particular panelist or a more general one for all of them, uh, you can put it in the chat at any time during the presentation. Um, you can also send me a private message if you have any questions or technical issues and I'll do my best to help out. Thanks. Thanks so much, Vicki. I'm going to share my screen. So each speaker is going to have 10 minutes to discuss uh, their work and their practice and the things that they're thinking about with Indigenous digital humanities. And I'm going to uh, introduce them all. I've put together a little slide deck with their faces so you know who I'm talking about. First, of course, we had Dr. Dave Gartner. Uh, Dave is, um, well, he's introduced himself, which is, which is wonderful, but um, he, what he didn't say is that he has recently had a book come out um, called, titled The Theater of Regret, Literature, Art, and the Politics of Reconciliation in Canada. So congratulations on that, Dave. We'll hear from my very good friend, um, Jerry Lawson, who is a proud member of the Heltzik Nation and the manager of the Oral History and Language Lab at the Museum of Anthropology. He's worked in the field of information management and heritage digitization for over 15 years now. And he is one of the masterminds behind the Indigitization program, which he's going to share with you today. Uh, he also acts as the technology lead for the innovative um, uh, of course, our indigi indig indigitization program, and he sits on the board of directors for the First Peoples Cultural Council. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Trisha Logan, who is also Métis, and she's the head of research and engagement at the Residential School History and Dialogue Center. She's also cross-appointed as an assistant professor in the iSchool. She has held various roles, uh, including roles at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation in Winnipeg, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg, and the National Aboriginal Health Organization and the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. She's worked with survivors of residential schools and completed research on the Métis experience in residential schools. And she also worked on a Michif language re uh, revitalization project. Then we'll hear, hear from Courtney Durand, who is a student in the First Nations and Indigenous Studies program. She is Nehia, Métis, Dutch, and Ukrainian, and we're very pleased to have you join us today, Courtney. 
Dr. Jeffrey Ansloos will be joining us as well after Courtney. Uh, we're very lucky to have him coming to us today from the University of Toronto's OISE program. He is a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Critical Studies in Indigenous Health and Social Action on Suicide. Dr. Ansloos is Nehia and English and is a member of the Fisher River Cree Nation in Treaty 5 territory. He'll probably tell you that he grew up in Winnipeg and currently resides in Toronto. Next, we will have Maya Dario join us, uh, who is a student in um, a PhD student in anthropology at the University of British Columbia. And her research is very interesting as it uses uh, cartography to articulate how hybrid spaces of belonging and identity are mediated by language in the urban settings of Kathmandu and New York City. Looking forward to hearing from you, Maya. Then Dr. Mark Turn will close us out uh, with some reflections on the panel. Dr. Turin is an associate professor um, who is cross-appointed between the Institute for Critical and Indigenous Studies and the Department of Anthropology. He writes and teaches on language reclamation, revitalization, documentation and conservation, language mapping, policies, and politics and language rights, orality, archives, digital tools, and technology. So we're very, very fortunate to have this distinguished panel uh, join us today for this wonderful conference. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pass it over to Jerry Lawson. So thank you, Sarah, for the, uh, for the introduction. It's really nice to be here and be amongst friends. I think I know a lot of people on the panel and I'm really excited to hear from, uh, especially the people that I don't know because the rest of us kind of talk together and know um, pr probably an amount about what people are gonna say. Uh, and thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'd just like to start off by um, just reaffirming that I'm Helchik, that, um, about where that is. My father's from Bella Bella, which is the center of the Helchik Nation, and it's about 500 kilometers north of Vancouver. Um, his name is Chester Lawson, and his Helchik name is Komogoyu. He's one of our uh, hereditary heat moss in our communities, and I carry the name of my grandfather, Jimmy Lawson, um, Malagius. And again, being Helchik informs everything I do personally and um, professionally. It's a uh, part of who I am. It's a primary part of my identity. It affects um, the work that you're about to see. Uh, and again, I'm here to talk a little bit about my work with the uh, Indigenization program, um, a program that's been running since, um, as a grant program since 2013, um, as a pilot project a little bit before that. And for people who haven't been introduced to it, it's a set of uh, resources to help Indigenous communities to digitize their own, digitize and preserve their own cultural heritage recordings. Um, and it's information for managers, for technicians. We administer a grant program that provides matching funds. Uh, that accompanying that is in-person training and uh, if needed equipment lending. Um, so something that we don't get asked as much anymore, but uh, um, we used to quite often is the why. Is why is it needed to digitize differently for indigenous collections? And um, for uh, those who can't see the screen, I've got a language map of British Columbia on screen. And British Columbia is a very uh, dense, pl diverse place in terms of indigenous culture and language. We have over 34 language. We have 34 languages, over 93 dialects, um, hundreds, if not thousands, of um, recordings in community, and most of the risk associated with information management projects falls in the Indigenous community. Um, when we're starting Indigenization, communities would not give up custody of their recordings. It just didn't happen. Um, and it's a matter of trust and more accurately distrust. Um, since contact knowledge has been extracted from our communities, stolen, used inappropriately, um, our own knowledge has been weaponized against us repeatedly. Um, knowledge has been twisted to create policies that affect our communities without our communities really being um, a part of those processes. That uh, we've had researchers come in, do master's degrees for three, research for three months, write something, become experts in our communities, and then be called on to develop policy for how our communities should be um, 
administered by colonial governments. Um, and for any number of reasons, our communities would not give up their precious fragments of knowledge that they hold dearly in communities, even if that means that they have obsolete um, playback machines and can't even access those tapes or that knowledge themselves. Um, and what about the other side, the uh, complicity of uh, colonial institutions and um, our uh, information um, practitioners that when we started our program, there was literally no appropriate funding for Indigenous communities, that um, colonial, institute, uh, colonial governments and funding agencies were failing cultural heritage preservation in general. There wasn't enough money to preserve. Um, people love to fund new content generation and filmmaking and other things, but when it comes to preservation, it's expensive and it's complicated and people don't like to fund that quite as much. And when it came to funding for preservation, most of those uh, funding mechanisms held uh, accreditation and um, requirements that Indigenous community organizations couldn't meet. And they required open access, which no um, Indigenous collections could really um, adhere to, that we all have um, our cultural access protocols that, that hold a tier above Western information practice protocols. So people were having real trouble accessing funding to, to digitize. But beyond that, our own information practitioners were gatekeeping digitization that the knowledge was hard to come by. People who knew how to digitize didn't share that information easily. And best practices were written in so deep in jargon from both the um, technical audio engineering, broadcast engineering, and archival side that they were impenetrable, that um, people would research them and come out with no idea of how to proceed. I'm convinced that a lot of this, in, in talking to people about it, a lot of this was actual gatekeeping, that there's a culture of people who haven't been trained properly should not be doing this work. And so Indigenous communities were absolutely one of those marginalized communities that was left in the cold in terms of um, being exposed to practices that worked. So Indigenization has primarily supported audio cassette digitization, and the guides we develop are as jargon-free as we can make them, and the grant doesn't require any open access or specific access requirements. We like to ask people to develop access protocols in the digital realm that work for their own community, but we don't require anything of them. I'm really grateful to have Sarah as the chair, and I think hopefully she can um, answer any questions if they come up um, that pertain to her role, but uh, she really drove forward a lot of the um, innovation in the grant itself that we every year um, year over year, tried to make the grant more accessible and more sustainable and better for communities to retain skills and, um, um, and be successful in digitization. I like to think that indigenization doesn't really solve pro problems so much as remove barriers that allow communities to do the work they've been trying to do for a long time. Um, and in the time that we've been running, we've helped to um, fund 45 projects in 34 communities, about 11,500 cassettes digitized, that's just within those funded projects. That doesn't count for uh, tapes that have been digitized um, using the legacy of skills and equipment that are in communities. We're also extremely lucky to be um, part of the National Research Council um, Indigenous Language Technologies Project that we're, um, we've got some funding to expand our resources uh, by a lot, and it's daunting, but um, we're growing into areas that are more that were more complex than we've been able to deal with before. Uh, video formats yield huge files that are hard to manage, and um, equipment is harder to come by and um, more difficult. The troubleshooting is more difficult. So we're developing resources um, that hopefully are simple enough to help people move forward for things like VHS and beta and camcorder formats and open reel audio, mini micro cassette. And, but beyond that, really exciting. We've got a really good team that's working on developing new guides around information collections management, things that we haven't been able to dive in deeply enough to really help people in the past. We're developing some guides so that um, people can put together simple collections management systems that work with the digitization systems and forms that we're developing. And then of course, um, buying and setup guides for this older equipment. Um, what search terms do you use and how do you approach it? 
Um, so everything we do really comes from entirely a community focus. And I, I like to think that indigenization works because when it was first developed, the team that was involved had a deep knowledge of prevalent issues of what the barriers were. We weren't approaching it from a colonial standpoint of how to do a colonial thing better. We were approaching it from where are the barriers to community and how can we find a practical way to move forward. We held our own relationships. We knew who was trying to do this work. Um, and I think we really sort of got that critical mass of being able to make a difference enough initially that, uh, that people took a little bit of notice and um, continued funding the work. So again, um, it was sort of beyond our wildest dreams that we would be able to be funded at the level we have to run an actual grant program around this work, um, but to still be doing it and to actually be growing is really uh, something that I think we're very proud of. Just to look at our partnerships a little bit because this is a collaboration panel. This is funded by the Irvin K. Barber Learning Center at UBC, part of the UBC library system. Um, I work with the Museum of Anthropology. The UBC iSchool has been a partner from early on and is really, um, that interaction has been critical to bringing students on and having students work in a real meaningful way with Indigenous communities without being forced to take on relationships and actually do damage to um, relationships or to even the UBC brand, if you want to look at it that way. The initial pilot project included the Namgis Nation, the Helchik Culture Education Center, and the Tanaha Archives. Um, We've been ongoing working with the Helchik Culture Education Center, it being my own community. Um, that they've been testing our methodology for years and giving us feedback. Shortly after starting the grant program, we, um, the UNBC archives, the University of Northern BC archives and Prince George um, joined us, joined our steering committee and um, joined the program and has really, really exposed areas that we didn't realize we weren't communicating with well and really filled in some of the pins in the uh, central and northeast part of the province and these are center east part of the province that uh, you don't know what you don't know and it's only through bringing on partnerships that uh, new relationships can really come to you effectively and we've been working with the sustainable heritage network who also support the mukutu um, indigenous content management system um, through my, and michael Wynn is uh from the sustainable heritage network is on our steering committee uh, we have growing partnership with UBC Okanagan and um, the First Peoples Cultural Council has taken our resources and is using them to train their um, for their uh, much larger Digi grant. Uh, Mount Royal University in Calgary has brought us out to run um, uh, training programs with the uh, Blackfoot community uh, and the Musqueam Archives, Holtz Cultural Education Center again and Vivo Western Front. Um, as well as a couple of um, archivist friends who are independent, uh, Christy Waller and Janet Grasley, all working on this new project, helping us to grow our resources. We have a large team. We have a lot of people who really know what sort of barriers there are out there and who have put a lot of thought into how to mindfully approach practical solutions. Um, and everybody brings their own capacities and passions to the project. I think we keep the community focus as, as tightly as we can. I'm not really sure what to say beyond that, that uh, I think collaboration comes through deep understandings and relationships between the collaborators. So um, I, I think I'll leave it there. Um, while it's Gaska, um, thank you. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the rest of the panelists. Thank you so much, Jerry, for that wonderful presentation of the program. Our next speaker is Dr. Trisha Logan. Trisha, I invite you to share your screen. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you, Jerry. It's so lovely to see everybody. I hope everyone can see that okay. Yeah. We can get a nod. Okay, thanks. I'm showing a, a photo of our center. For anyone who's not familiar with the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center at UBC, the building here is placed between the Irvin K. Barber Learning Center and the Kerner Library. And um, for, yeah, for anyone who hasn't had a chance to visit or knows a lot about the center, uh, it's still relatively new. It's, we're still a relatively new building and new center uh, at UBC Vancouver. It's placed between, I always, when people come to visit, when people are able to come visit the center, uh, of course, uh, the building hasn't been open for several months now, like a lot of our buildings. Um, 
and one of the first things we talk about when people come into the building is the the placement of where the building is between those two very one of the oldest buildings on the UBC campus uh, UBC Vancouver campus is kind of an intervention is kind of a, a literal or metaphorical intervention into a western academic uh, university institution and and in this very beautiful space there's an outside space uh, connected through the gallery through kind of sliding doors where you can go into the garden landscaped area and the pond because even if it, even the way people use the building uh, knowing that a lot of the records and a lot of the stories that are um, being talked about and researched and listened to in the building are often this is kind of a, a space for trauma and a space for for healing a space for kind of uh, safe and respectful dialogue uh, but also that it's a space for respite and for warmth and for uh, people to bring their families there's a, a corner of the gallery that has children's books and children's toys so people can feel welcome to bring their families with them as a physical space for survivors intergenerational survivors and um, for anyone who visits the center <laughs> here's here's a photo I, not a great photo um this is the interesting i guess the blessing uh, when people kind of jokingly or not jokingly you talk about the blessings of uh, pandemic conditions is there's a lot said about the the digital interactive systems inside our gallery and inside our building and of course that's the the interesting question that came with now that the building is closed things that were um being tested and were being we were thinking about creating online or digital or alternate spaces um, now since the building can't be used right now and has to be closed and it had to be it had to become a bigger question about um, how we used uh, online digital spaces oh, sorry <laughs> i'm losing my mind here um, sorry um, these are the websites uh, the first website, sorry, I just skipped over my last slide there, um, and I don't know how to get it back because uh, every time I click on it, I lose it. Um, these are our websites. The top website is the main website, and the second one is the collections website. And part of that, um, the digital interactives, and I can see my colleague Emily uh, in the room here, and I'm sure she'd be the first person to caution me towards talking about the digital screens and how we use them is a lot of it still is in a and was when the building was open in a testing phase. And part of that testing is is how people enter or how people engage with the information. And there's three different modes to the wall, the large digital screen on our wall in the building. There's a map function, a timeline function, a linear timeline function and a thematic nodes function. Uh, so you can switch screens between those three um, modes and it's interesting it's fascinating because the users of the center physically or now online and through zoom and through phone calls and through all sorts of different kind of socially distant modes the way people use the center and the way people use the the collections website uh, they it's how people enter it um, through those different ways of knowing um, and it's really interesting especially at the time when people could visit the center and classes from UBC different departments different faculties different kinds of classes from all across the university um, k-12 schools teachers students classes um, sometimes kindergarten classes sometimes grade eight uh, high school kids often professional development uh, staff and um, faculty at UBC, but also out of, outside of UBC, sometimes public servants, uh, teachers, clergy members, and of course, uh, survivors and intergenerational survivors and First Nations, Métis, Inuit community members, how people use the space, entering the, the records through the map, through the locations of where residential schools were in Canada, uh, through the timeline, through kind of a visual timeline of images and texts, and then through the thematic nodes um you can you you watch how people scroll through it and enter it enter the uh, access the records and 
interchangeably move between the digital wall, the screens where there's kind of the audio cones over top to listen to videos and audio, and then go back towards some of the kiosks, the individual personalized kind of private kiosks with headphones or between the um, iPads or other other ways to look at it. And this is the question we have now without people physically being able to use the space, how we can um, talk about it. One of the big questions we have about the records of residential schools is part of what part of the work that I do and my colleagues in our metadata team, um, some of the big questions in our education and programming is how to provide health support and how to provide safe, respectful space and now online or, or um, in recorded formats. Um, because sometimes survivors are now still, I think there's, um, as survivors are recording their stories and um, either online or uh, talking to their families and recording it for their own families or for an archive or for a record or for the center, um, even though through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission between 2009 to 2015, uh, because there were so many survivors that told their stories, uh, what still, still there's, um, and I think people forget that, and I, and I forget it myself, having worked with survivors of residential school for a long time, I forget that myself, that sometimes people sit down to record their story, to handwrite it, to record it on a phone, uh, for the first time, for the first time, that's the first time they've ever recorded it or told their family or told their spouses. Um, and so providing health support and cultural support uh, is still important as important as for people who've told their story numerous times and who've who've recorded it and re-recorded it and speak openly and speak publicly um, and all sorts of questions about access and privacy and uh, how people will access and how people wish to access it or how that consent and access would change over time um, and this is as as our own collection our um, online and uh, in person are all digital surrogates, mostly digital surrogates. Um, we also have the Loie Brissenden collection that is a collection of Larry Loie's uh, writings and recordings and images and documents that his, um, his wife and widow, uh, Constant Brissenden, has been working with the center very closely and with my colleague Emily and Naomi to um, create an original collection at the center. Uh, but as people as archives proactively disclose and start to uh, digitize new collections, uh, new images, new documents, things that people haven't seen, that's also the same question is for the for some families, intergenerational survivors, survivors and community members, some of the photos they're seeing are for the first time because they have been digitized, because they are now available online when they weren't available online. Um, and there's continually a question of, how can families, um, how do we tell our families about these stories? Like how people still have to come to grips with now that it's on YouTube or now that it's on online, how uh, that it's being shared, how do we talk about it? And this is another kind of the counter side to the, the health and the well being is there's a lot of violence online. Uh, I've, for the years that I've been working on histories of residential schools, there's this increase in denial and increase in the use of. Um, <laughs> for, and I, I'm only laughing for, for decades, for a long time, probably 10, 5, 10, 20 years ago, use of the term genocide or use of the term colonial or cultural genocide was, was used by survivors of residential school quite often when they would explain or talk about their stories or their experiences. But in, even in university settings and in the public media, it wasn't used very often and people didn't know how to use it. Now it, you can see it's being used, uh, it's weaponized. Words are words and digital spaces are weaponized. And of course, I'm sure there's a lot to be said about how misinformation grows and how we use digital formats to combat denial and misinformation and violence and trying to show credible and uh, supportive and how important those safe and respectful culturally safe spaces are what that really means and how a, a role as people who are archivists and researchers and education and programming and teachers 
how our role as advocates is to learn about uh, how to combat denial and violence and in digital spaces and the form that it takes. And our colleague from the Indian Residential School Settle as Survivors Society, Jeremy, always uses the, the very cool term cultural agility uh, for diverse different communities, First Nations and Métis and Inuit communities. And if now that's come to digital agility, how we have to kind of change the way we've done work, not only because of pandemic conditions, but because uh, how to reach different segments of the community. It's uh, we're teaching virtual classes. Uh, my colleagues Jess and Jess Boone and Shannon and Kim Lawson have been working with youth and have been working with options for doing podcasts and doing online forums. And uh, myself and all of my colleagues, we've been working with survivors in different ways. Uh, it's really case by case basis of how um, I've sometimes I've been in uh, survivors have been meeting in person, but kind of socially distant sitting um, a few feet or several meters away from each other. And I'm on a Zoom call and I can kind of hear some people and I kind of can't, but then um, someone calls me on the cell phone and puts me on the Zoom on the cell phone. <laughs> and you know, we're, we're, fig we're figuring it out as we go, as everyone else is. Um, and sometimes it just means that I'm printing out copies of things online uh, that people can't access and putting it on a piece of paper and putting it in the mail. And so I'm just gonna, I'll close here. I think I'm reaching my 10 minutes. Um, sorry if I've gone a little over, uh, but this is a, I, um, this is a part of Maria Campbell's Jacob um, that I really like. And it's, when we were talking about the relevance of our, our lived experiences in digital systems, I think about these stories and I think about this, uh, this quote from Jacob, a story about residential schools by Maria Campbell. And I'll just leave it up there for people to read. Thank you so much, Tricia. I would love to invite our next speaker, Courtney Durand, to share her screen or come online. Actually, uh, Sarah, I think Jeff is, Jeffrey Antlis is going to go first. In that oh, order. Jeff's going to go Sarah first. Is. Okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry I should have let you know. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah, so Courtney and I will sort of tag team this with about five minutes each. Um, so, uh, Tanse, bonjour, bonjour, it's good to be with um, you all today. I just really want to say thank you to Trisha as well. I, I, I think this is the first time you and I have ever had the opportunity to cross paths together, but we have a lot of shared uh, histories in the city of Winnipeg. Um, and as, um, you know, as a, as a member of a family that gave testimony to the commission, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's just really stirs my spirit to think about the ethical practice you're describing in thinking about how to care for my grandmother's and my mother's stories as they sit in those archives. Um, and yeah, I, I also as a, a psychologist, I know I'm like the the odd one in this group, you know, a, a social scientist snuck into the meeting. Um, and uh, as a social scientist, as a psychologist who works with survivors, um, specifically, I, I just, I really appreciate the, the tenderness and the care at which you just described, um, Tricia. So thank you, um, to Miigwech. Um I want to just briefly describe some of the work that one of my labs um, does. It's the Decolonizing Digital Labs and Archive. Uh, we are kind of an interdisciplinary group that works at the University of Toronto um, that is really exploring, um, I think one of our primary questions is about how to think about how to think and work ethically in digital spaces um, that are uh, contested territories that are both um, driven and run by corporate private interests often that are regulated and surveilled by the settler state in addition to its um, interlockers like corporations and policing. And then um, also to think about what it means that Indigenous people repurpose and occupy these spaces for purposes that are unexpected, like the promotion of language, like the promotion of health and mental health and well-being, um, like cultural resurgence, artistic resurgence and reawakenings. These, these dynamic practices that were often in my field linked to foundations and contours of what promotes health and well-being. Um, what it means to think about these non-neutral contested spaces being a context for that work. Um, so we have a variety of projects that we are engaged in. We are working um, with uh, a project, a partnership project um, that brings together First Nations um, communities and over 60 um, Indigenous focused 
language arts and um, community health promotion based networks um, into conversation around the ethics of how that data is used and studied and examined by the major social media companies. So Facebook, um, Twitter and Google and Microsoft. Um, and so, yeah, we've learned a lot from that project. I think similar to what Trisha has just mentioned, I think the, the most, you know, the, the most telling aspects of that project have been around the prevalence of disinformation, hate speech, and real strategically targeted um, content and networks that uh, disrupt and that uh, really attack uh, Indigenous people's efforts to utilize digital environments and spaces in ways that are generative and, and that add value and, and vitality to communities' lives. And on the flip side, we've also seen some really incredibly creative um, uses of these technologies that are producing um, very distinct um, contributions to Indigenous language reawakening, to cultural and artistic resurgence, and also to um, social and political organizing around critical issues of um, Indigenous health and social um, equity in Canada. The second project that we are deeply engaged in these days is helping to discuss with communities what it means that public health agencies of Canada um, are actively surveilling Indigenous communities data, uh, that is social media data, to make predictions, to monitor the, the rise and um, risks related to pandemics and to other health contagion emergencies. And so this has presented a bunch of ethical questions for us about what how, how to apply, how to consider Indigenous research ethics at the intersection of public health ethics of surveillance and what, um, and what those implications are in a time like COVID-19 uh, when people really want to have actionable information to protect the public, um, but at, the at what cost and at what, and whose who's privacy, whose mobility is most directly impacted by those uh, impositions of surveillance technologies, which are of course modeled for more frequently policing more than anything else. Uh, the second thing, or the third thing that our, our Decolonizing Digital Project does is it helps work with communities to uh, develop uh, standards for community sovereign data collection of their own vital statistics. Um, and that's something that's been really important because of course, while indigenous communities have endless data collected about them by federal governments and by corporations, um, these accessing this data is very difficult. And so making informed decisions around social policy and health policy, it becomes incredibly important to help support communities um, in the collection of data that's relevant to their own interests in terms of advocacy. So those are the sort of big things that we're up to. I think if I could say the biggest learning that we've been having is what it means to think about consent in ways that are iterative, um, to think about consent in digital environments in ways that are legible um, and that are not meant to safeguard um, corporate interests, but are meant to safeguard the, the human rights of indigenous people. Um, and to think about uh, how to meaningfully advocate and um, I think apply pressure and public accountability to um, the major corporations that actually hold sort of the, the backdoor key to that data and information. Um, and so one of the implications is that we've been consulting with the federal government on some of its data stewardship uh, legislation related to um, the release of that information uh, back to communities from social media companies. So we would love to see essentially a legislative move that compels the uh, corporate companies like Facebook and Google and Twitter and, and others to submit their data back to communities. So hopefully we'll make some traction on that, but I'll, uh, I'll pass it on to Courtney. Uh, in my research with Jeffrey Anslus and David Gartner, uh, I found that there are many different identities online that grapple with visibility, invisibility, and anonymity, from Saudi Arabian activist women to Black LGBTQ people in Nairobi and Johannesburg to refugee youth. Um, the work of Ganesh et al, Mugo and Antoinette, uh, Lurs and Al-Sharif all contend with these themes of risk and visibility, but notably they all share the sentiment of the importance of writing oneself into existence online as a powerful move of autonomy and kinship. This is especially relevant to Indigenous people and even more so Indigenous youth who exist in a world that actively seeks to erase them. 
And while this is a beautiful expression of the potential of online communities, we must not forget what Crosby and Monaghan found in their study of this massive Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada documents. And that is that agencies such as RCMP, CSIS, Integrated Terrorism Assessment Centre, Department of National Defence, which is the Army, um, Public Safety Canada, Government Operations Canada, and then of course Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada are all conducting surveillance and collecting data on Indigenous people through various social media platforms online. And with youth becoming more involved in activism, it's no stretch to assume that they're being being constructed as Aboriginal extremists in this climate of surveillance and hypercriminalization. These intertwined politics, uh, or sorry, these are intertwined politics with research ethics, and I think it's important to know the state and stakes of being online before conducting research. So now, as far as what I found specifically on the use of social media data uh, comes down to authorship, and there's some scholars that argue once it's online, a, a person fully consents to it being potentially used, and there's no need to develop relationships with that person to do so, while others say it's imperative to ask an individual to be part of research, regardless of re what research ethics, words, and standards according to the Tri-Council policy statement are. Specifically, Andrea uh, Zafiro's work has been essential to understanding the complexities of digital data, specifically social media data and research within Canada. Her, her work brought me to the question, if we're consenting to post our thoughts, intellectual and cultural property and the like online, then where does the right to, of refusal to be involved in research fit in? And if part of the consent process is the, is the ability to withdraw, then how do we do that in online spaces where data is treated as a free resource to aggregate and consume? Um, this I've not been able to answer fully, but I hope that as researchers and scholars in this field, we can begin to think about how best to attend to relationships in the digital sphere. Uh, sorry, I tried to get that done as quickly as possible. <laughs> uh, that was that was wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Courtney. Um, wow, so much there in such a such a small amount of time. Um, okay. Moving along, um, and just a, just a reminder to the audience, feel free to, to be chatty. Um, there's, there's lots of space in that chat to ask questions of speakers who've gone before or who are coming up. So with that, I would love to introduce um, Maya Dario, who is a PhD student in anthropology. Thanks so much, Maya, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm really honored to be on this panel and um, there's so much to think about in, in terms of what I've just heard all of the, the previous um, speakers and panelists say. And uh, so I'm just really appreciative of this opportunity. I would like to talk about a language mapping project that is part of a partnership between researchers at UBC, Mark Turin and myself, uh, Sienna Craig at Dartmouth, Daniel Kaufman and Ross Perlin at the Endangered Language Alliance in New York City, and web developer Jason Lample from uh, A Better Map in Colorado. This project is funded by the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies. As you can see, we are spread out across different territories and nation states. And my participation in this project, just to be clear, began after all of the language data had been collected and it builds on already established relationships between the Endangered Language Alliance in New York City um, and community researchers, community institutions, and in-depth linguistic and historical knowledge about New York's language communities. So I can't provide a lot of information about the data collection process or the languages themselves. I come to this partnership now as a PhD student in anthropology with a master's in geography, many years professional experience as a GIS analyst, um, and as a volunteer in various humanitarian mapping efforts. So my role has been to help with GIS processing and to engage both intellectually and from a technical standpoint with the limitations of our capacity to represent the complexities of linguistic diversity and marginalization. By the time I became involved, this beautiful map had already been made of all the languages in New York City in their own orthographies. But there's a lot of complexity and layers of information that simply can't be captured in a static map. We've spent the last year working on a digital map that allows the user to interact with the scale and location of the map view itself and also to query and explore the rich and contextualized information behind each language. We also wanted to try and do this using open, whoops, 
open source tools and documentation practices in order to enable others to replicate our process, which we'll be focusing on more going forward this year. While this interactive map I'll be showing examples of today is almost complete, we haven't yet launched it publicly, so I'll just be showing some snapshots of what we've accomplished so far. One of the goals of the partnership behind this mapping project is to address the phenomenon of invisibility of New York City's diverse language communities. New York City, in fact, is the most linguistically diverse urban area in the world with over 600 unique languages spoken across more than a thousand locations across the city and in neighboring areas such as New Jersey and Long Island. We know this from the inspiring work of the Endangered Language Alliance, uh, which has been working with community researchers to create this data set that locates speakers and important community institutions which support these speakers, as well as provides rich narrative descriptions contextualizing the presence of these communities in New York. Take, for example, the Judaic Arabic Iraqi community, the description for which includes the immigration and settlement patterns of Iraqi Jews, as well as the distinctive religious and cultural institutions in New York City, which facilitate community cohesion and language retention. Aside from illustrating New York City's tremendous ethno-linguistic diversity for which it is known and celebrated and by which it has long been defined, why does this matter? Well, people who come from linguistically minoritized groups are ever more mobile, migrating often out of socioeconomic necessity and settling in urban areas in their own countries and beyond. New York City is but one of many increasingly linguistically diverse urban areas across the globe where the resettlement patterns of language communities are complex and understudied. Mapping the distribution of languages in urban areas can help identify social, political, and public health needs in linguistically marginalized communities um, in order to advocate for inclusive and equitable language policy. The relevance and urgency of this imperative was made tragically clear during the height of the corona corona coronavirus pandemic in New York City. And another part of this project has been collecting news stories, research endeavors, and audio diaries from language communities themselves, documenting how linguistic marginalization and what we are referring to as the epidemiology of invisibility exacerbated existing vulnerabilities and resulted in dis disproportionately negative health outcomes for New York's immigrant diaspora communities. The experience of these communities in New York City also offers insight into urban spaces as potential sites where ethno-linguistic identities can flourish in diaspora contexts in ways that were unimaginable at home, precisely because they are freed from oppressive state systems and homeland contexts that foreclose certain forms of linguistic agency and cultural visibility. The largest concentration of Sherpa living outside of Nepal's capital city of Kathmandu is now in the borough of Queens in New York City. And I'll just note that the Sherpa are an ethno-linguistic ethno group from Nepal, not a verb, nor synonymous with words. The establishment of a Sherpa social and cultural organization that supports members to celebrate being together at important life stages and ceremonies has facilitated the maintenance of group identity, the preservation of cultural heritage, a supportive community of practice, and Sherpa language learning. Dr. Pazang Sherpa, an indigenous Sherpa intellectual and anthropologist who visited UBC last year, and some of you may have met in person, describes a member of one of these organizations hearing elements of a Sherpa ritual being explained in the Sherpa language noting that even in their ancestral homeland of Solo Kumbu in Eastern Nepal, prayers at home or in local monasteries were always recited in the more dominant liturgical Tibetan rather than their own Sherpa language. Visibility and representation matter. And I think the efficacy and value of harnessing cartography to shine a light on the presence and distribution of New York City's diverse language communities is evident in this language mapping project, which engages community researchers, which provides historical and current information about mobility patterns, which highlights sites and strategies for ongoing language vitality or emergent revitalization, 
and which represents languages in their own orthography is itself a powerful representational practice. Our partnership is not under the illusion, however, that this project is without risks and limitations. Developing this interactive map has in fact presented an opportunity to lean into the complexity of representation. The limitations of cartographic geometries for conveying linguistic diversity and the risks associated with plotting vulnerable immigrant communities on a map in today's America, among other things. We know, for example, of multiple instances where community centers or religious institutions serve as places of congregation for people who may be from the same country and practice the same religion, like the Al Hikmah Mosque in Astoria here where you can see a cluster of eight different languages represented. We also know, however, that a single apartment building in Jackson Heights, Queens can house speakers of 11 different languages. How do you represent the specificity of that kind of diversity on a map? And what are the risks associated with doing so? What does it mean to put a dot on a map to represent a community of speakers? Would a polygon be a better representational model to indicate the presence of speakers across a neighborhood? How would you decide where the boundary for that community ends and another begins? Part of our approach has been to engage with these questions, to recognize that the map we create will not address all of the concern, concerns around representation, and to try to be transparent about our process and the spatial imprecision of the data in the map. Cartography and linguistic cartography in particular has long been one of the classificatory, classificatory tools of imperial powers to delineate languages, peoples, and borders in the image of how they wish the world to be in order to control and manage access to resources and power. These cartographies of empire perpetuate hegemonic narratives which marginalize certain linguistic identities an attempt to fix and locate languages and people in place or wipe them off the map altogether in what may be called the cartographies of erasure, to borrow the words of Dr. Bernard Curley, the new director of the Institute for Critical Indigenous Studies. It is another form of hegemony and erasure to center Western cartographic praxis and dismiss the conceptual cartographies and spatial discourses of indigenous peoples around the world. In embarking on a language mapping project that seeks to subvert cartographies of erasure by rendering visible linguistically minor minoritized communities on a map, we also have to contend with these technological limitations of a digital cartography, which lacks the imagination to map, for example, plurilingual linguistic identities or lived experiences of marginalization. So in the context of mobilizing digital tools and spaces which subvert hegemonic practices and narratives and which provide representational and storytelling power for marginalized language communities, we have to attend to both the histories and instruments of erasure, as well as the uncertainties and limitations of digital visibility. Thank you so much, Maya. That was very interesting. Those maps are wonderful. I think there are some questions that will be asked about that later on. Um, but now I would like to pass the, uh, the floor over to Dr. Mark Turin, who's going to offer some closing reflections and uh, some information about his work as well. So Mark, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all. Thank you, David, also for your wonderful intro. I'm going to try and do a little of an outro. It will be difficult, though, even with a generous helping of time, which we don't have, to weave together these hugely stimulating and varied presentations. But with the pressure of time, it's next to impossible. I want to make sure there's time for Q&A and for discussion. So to that end, I'm just gonna make three brief points. First, we all know that digital technologies mediate our experiences. In this round table, we've actually been much more interested in the ways that indigenous experiences and knowledge systems mediate the digital technologies and cyberspace that we're active in. We now live and we now work in such hyper digitized spaces with portable devices, databases, materials present in all aspects of our lives, and ever more so during this enduring and frightening pandemic and this weird Zoomiverse in which we're all spending so much time. All of which to say the very word digital is becoming less relevant. So while the term 
digital humanity still has some traction and it can be helpful, can we foresee a time in the not so distant future when the digital aspect of humanities and social science scholarship will be implicit and in which we refer instead to an era of analog humanities before access to computing power was so widespread? Second, I'd like to return for a moment to this idea of inspired practices, or as Jeffrey just said so powerfully, dynamic practices. Ideas modeled so generously and effectively by each of these presentations in unique and distinct ways. Unworkable standards and a dogmatic insistence on best practice in digital technologies are often set by scholars and funding agencies, and these can have a very disempowering impact on individuals and communities. Even well-funded academic research programs, archives, library systems, museums are not always able to adhere to the standards that they themselves promote and advocate. No surprise then that community-based digital projects that utilize emerging technologies, often without sustainable funding and without academic partnerships outside, risk being silenced in a culture that promotes unrealistic technical ideals. The First Nations in BC Knowledge Network encourages us and invites us to consider the much more generative and frankly much more interesting term, inspired practices. Third, and a final point, not all digital humanities work is research. An overemphasis on funding mechanisms for academic research can and does divert energy and resources from community needs in order to fulfill research agendas and strategic objectives set by post-secondary institutions and the national research councils that fund them. We need to talk about this and we need to address it. Quite obviously, not only research agendas and funding, but also the very criteria of what counts as success must be designed, determined and implemented by communities themselves. For Indigenous communities to continue to participate in and to co-create this shared digital future, we need a lot more investment in the common digital backbone. Infrastructure and capital costs are rarely one-off and technology investments have to be long-term and equitable, not just for communities themselves, but also for the organizations that support them. So with those few thoughts, I'd like to hand it back to our chair, to Sarah, and also perhaps to uh, Vicky, who I think is moderating the, the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. I will pass it over to Vicky to introduce a couple of questions that did come through the chat. Hopefully that will warm people up and we'll have some more um, either through the chat or feel free to turn your microphone on um, or raise your hand in the participants function for additional questions. So Vicki, over to you. Hi, thanks so much. So there are two questions. Um, one was partially answered, but I'm going to read it out again in case there's more discussion. Um, it was for Jerry. It says, as you know, the tech sector uses the open source concept. Would there be a comparable indigenous concept? Thinking of songs and stories that are passed on under strict sharing protocols where the learner can slightly modify details. Um, I'm not sure about anything specifically around sort of knowledge reuse, like um, like collective commons. Um, and so, but there are traditional knowledge labels. I did put it into the chat that uh, something that's been used by the Reciprocal Research Network at the Museum of Anthropology. It's you, uh, I think, developed and used in uh, Mukatu and and in a number of different uh, platforms and systems and collections. Uh, it's uh, it's intended for communities uh, to be able to define different knowledges according to their use and what people are able to do or when they're able to access. So th there is something similar uh, for sure. And I uh, would encourage everybody to check out tr the tr traditional knowledge labels. And um, I think there are probably other people on the panel who can speak far better to that uh, concept than I can. Does anybody else on the panel want to speak to that or should we move on to the next? Uh, let's move on. The next question is for um, Jeffrey. It's about getting data back from social media. The question is, are there barriers with the terms and conditions that we all click yes? Uh, I can see social media companies arguing that the data was voluntarily provided by users as in, uh, and not taken as in taking land and culture and knowledge. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, the, sh the short answer to that is yes. I mean, absolutely, social media companies would take the perspective that that click 
uh, on after a 50 page illegible legal document um, is enough uh, of a legal threshold to provide consent. I think that, um, you know, from like a critical indigenous feminist lens on research ethics, I don't think that meets the bar of iterative uh, informed consent. And I think, um, but, I, but I think if we're actually thinking about practical solutions from a legislative lens, I think that things like the UN DRIP, um, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, and the, the federal um, adoption, and especially for Indigenous advocacy groups to adopt data stewardship policies like OCAP, can set a legislative um, or a litigating floor from which social media companies um, who are operating in Canada have to contend with. And so I think those sorts of maneuvers, they're not answers to the ethical problem, but they are harm reducing measures that I think can push the conversation around ownership and access, privacy and control a little bit further forward. Um, I also think that, you know, technologists need to be thinking about ethics in much more dynamic ways um, that, that, that account for the iterative nature of consent. And certainly when we sign those documents, there's not much said about the likelihood of your exposure to racist hate speech. Uh, but yet we are, you know, is that a liability that these companies need to be considering? I, I don't know. But I hope that's a helpful start of reflections at least. Thank you. Um, we do have one uh, more question and it's for the whole panel. Um, it's Mark's point about academe's overemphasis on narrow notions of research is so important. Uh, can the whole panel talk about how we might push back against this narrowness? Well, since I threw it out there, and uh, thank you so much, Tara, and also thank you for your presentation. Uh, just, I think it was yesterday, it seems like a, another lifetime ago, it was extraordinary and powerful and compelling and really necessary. Uh, it was a great keynote. Uh, just to say, um, there are little ways that I'm seeing at least our own university system begin to respond. There are small grants um, that UBC uh, supports in which community members, uh, community organization and university-based researchers together apply for, but the money, if you're granted it, leaves the university and goes straight back into the community. In other words, so often we end up as the kind of gatekeepers, custodians, guardians. We're running kind of digital financial triage and it's horrible and it doesn't actually lead to generative or positive relations. So I think part of it is following the money back into communities and ensuring that uh, that kind of capacity is recognized, that people who are doing the work are recognized. And I think it's also a rebalancing of expertise. Simply put, you know, in I think previous generations, um, it was the academics who were thought to be the experts, right? And uh, God knows we had all kinds of terrible names to the people we worked with. Consultants, informants, I mean, it's just a horrible word. And I think that's being turned around in necessary and productive ways. We're not there yet, but we need to be part of that transformation of recognizing where expertise lies and de-authorizing ourselves in the process. Um yeah, to mirror a little bit of what Mark said, um, that narrowness is a really interesting thing in that the academy has sort of grown up looking at information in a very specific way in terms of, and to refer to my sister Kim's thesis that Sarah's linked to in the chat, in terms of fragments and breaking things into their narrowest possible understanding, and that's not the way Indigenous communities look at information. And what I'm seeing around me is um, British, um, Mark and I both work largely in the language domain, in language revitalization and supporting communities and doing the work that they need to do. And research doesn't do that. Research literally doesn't support language revitalization. It pretends to, and you create huge CERT grants that um, are all massed around language revitalization um, language um, jargon. But at the end of the day, a pittance of the money is going to communities and what they really need. And you're literally drawing community knowledge out of the community and out of working with community and creating language speakers. And in BC, we've had a record $50 million, a landmark $50 million investment in language. And what we're seeing is communities run away from um, either running away from linguistic research collaborations and doing the work they need to do, or else they're only engaging on their own terms and extracting what they need out of linguists. And that's really the measure that it should be. And I look at this as a pendulum that's been in extraction for a hundred years or more, and it needs to swing back. And the um, the academy needs to give back. Um, 
and figure out where they're useful. And in a lot of cases, I'm seeing that the academy isn't useful. So it's a really interesting thing to see people struggling to define research in, some, in, a, in a measure that's more useful to communities. And I think BC, what you're seeing is BC has investment in language and that's enabling communities to go their own way. And we don't have that everywhere. We don't have that everywhere in Canada. And globally, Indigenous communities are in far worse situations in terms of um, funding and support. So it is interesting to watch BC as sort of a microcosm of what can happen when communities have a bit of funding and resource to do what they need to do as opposed to tack on 14% on the edge of a shirt grant. So. I'm seeing some great applause with that. Oh, uh, Jeffrey, did you want to go ahead and, and give a last uh, response to that? Uh, sure. I, I was just going to say that I think uh, I really take Jerry's comment very seriously as a reminder that those of us who are researchers need to begin answering this question, always beginning from the place that we're complicit in the problem and never operate from the illusion that we're outside of the problem. Um, and I think if we're actually committed um, to redistributive practices, fugitive planning in higher education and university contexts of research, we actually have to, at the same time, be invested in decentering our own economic and social, um, not just privileges, but security. I think that that's like, it can't be about building the economies of universities or building the social capital of universities. It has to be a sort of rebuilding of a university outside of itself. And, and to me, that's a much, um, that's a that's a much harder political sell um, to universities, but I think it's 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 maybe the work that we do fugitively inside of um, or outside of and beyond. It. And honestly, I think it's a measure of like an ethical practice. If if we if we don't actually make that a priority, we're kind of just fooling ourselves into thinking that we're not the problem. Thank you so much for those comments and responses. We are just a little bit over time. So I would like to thank everybody on the panel today and all of the wonderful audience members. You've been fantastic. Um, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, so with that, thank you very much, everybody. This has been recorded. So if you want to share with your friends later, um, you may get an email with the link, I hope. Uh, otherwise, thanks for your attention and have a great rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of the conference.